Sometimes when making a game, you find that you're moving all of your objects at the exact same time or manipulating all of them in the same way all at the exact same time and it might not be what you want. Sometimes you want to control a specific instance of an object. Now there are ways to do that. So I've set up a few rooms here and let's hop into the script and we'll just look at all the different things we can do with instances which don't affect the objects as a blanket, it'll affect each different version of an object known as an instance. Some of these we may have already touched on, but it's good to have one video that goes through all of them. There are a few ways you can manipulate instances. You can create them, destroy them, change one into another, or copy one inside the room. So let me show you what some of these look like. In my first room for manipulating instances, I've just got this ship image that I've created and he doesn't do much, he just animates and that's about it. There's nothing else in this room, it's just object player and the instance for it. So inside, in my create event, I've just got his image speed here just so he animates at a certain speed and it looks good. I've put all the functions into this object ahead of time, so it's going to look very complicated, um, but we're just going to concentrate right now on the manipulating of instances. And the first one was instance create. Now here's the function where it shows up. This is pretty easy, it's just an if statement. If keyboard check press v case, so if I press the space bar, we're going to create an instance. And I've set it to the current exposition of the spaceship, plus 8, just to offset it a little bit, and then at its current Y value, and I'm going to create the object bullet, which is just a line, it's nothing fancy. Now the cool thing about creating an instance, if I middle click here, it returns a real value. And that number, that real value, is the ID of the instance that's being created. Using instance IDs is really powerful and it's something you're probably going to want to do a lot. Typically you're going to be storing it in a variable. In this case I'm storing the bullet I'm creating in a variable called new bullet and this is a throwaway variable here. It is local. I used var at the beginning which means after this code is run GameMaker forgets it just to free up memory. And then I get to do cool things with it. Uh, we're going to skip over all this for now, so just concentrate on right here, create the bullet. Then, here's the cool thing you can do when the ID of an instance is stored in a variable. Now, we can use that variable to reference this instance. So down here, I'm saying new bullet dot, if you remember the dot operator is so you can hop inside and change any kind of variable that's inside this instance. In this case, I'm going to change the horizontal speed by making it equal 16. So positive 16 will go to the right. So anytime I create a new bullet by pressing the space bar, it's going to move to the right by 16 pixels per step. Normally you could put that inside objects, like this bullet that we're gonna create. I could set it here, I could set my speed here, but I'm not doing that. Instead, I'm doing it from within a different object, a different instance of it, which is my spaceship. So that's one powerful way to do it. Um, if I hop in now, a little more is going to happen than just the one bullet, and we are going to get into that. All we want to concentrate on is if I press the space bar, I get that one bullet right there. So I create it, and it shoots out, and it moves at a horizontal speed of 16 pixels per step. And it did that because we told it to by using a dot operator, and GameMaker knew which one we were talking about because we stored the ID of the newly created instance in a variable. Now it wouldn't be very good if when we shot a bullet it went off screen and just went on forever because every time I created a new bullet that would take up more memory and it would just bog the game down eventually. So what we really want to do is be able to destroy it and that brings us to instance destroy. If we keep this open that's the next one. So inside the bullet all I've taken is the very simple other, this little diamond, outside room. This is something pre-made by Yo-Yo Games. It just checks if this instance is no longer within the boundaries of the room. And if it isn't, quite simply, instance destroy. There it is. If I had more code, if I had, let's see, code up here above the instance destroy and code down here, and I wrote a whole bunch of stuff, 
Just because Instance destroys on line 3 doesn't mean that GameMaker is going to ignore anything else. This entire event will still take place before this object or instance of object is removed from the game. So it's something to keep in mind that if you didn't want any of this following code to happen, then you would have to put in some sort of case here. Instance destroy will only really take place once this event is done. So that's just something to keep in mind. But anyway, I don't have anything else here anyway, so it's okay. So when it leaves the room, it gets destroyed. The next two things we can do are change or copy an instance. If we hop inside object player, I've got a change instance script right here, and it's really simple. It's just if I press the C key, see so if change, that's what I've chosen, then it will run this function instance change, and inside you need two arguments. You need what object you want it to now become, what it's going to change into, and then whether or not it should perform destroy and create events. Now I do want it to do that because if this new object had all the initialized variables inside the create event, yes, I do want it to do that. So whether to perform that new objects create and destroy events, yes, I want that to happen. So quite simply, if we hop back into our room and I press the C key, my ship will change into a giant button. Giant because the ship is actually being scaled up. But anyway, C key, there we go. It became a different instance. Now this is something cool you can do. It's really easy if um, instead of animations, instead of changing the different animations right here, you know, my ship can change into an explosion uh, sprite or something like that. If it needed to actually be another object and have different properties, this is the one way you would do it. Instance change. Then it'll become a completely different instance. Um, sometimes that's necessary. Sometimes what you're looking for is just making the sprite index and image index change to different animations. But it all depends on what game you're working on. Now for instance copy, I've done that in a very special way. You know that bullet we're creating that's traveling 16 pixels every step to the right? Well, let's hop inside the object for that. In the create event, I said, if the enemy object doesn't exist, which we're not going to worry about right now, I will go into that when we cover instance exists. But either way, it was just a check because I've got multiple rooms and multiple things going on. All we want to concentrate on right here is that I'm creating, once again, this local variable for instance copy. And it just wants to know, once again, do you want to perform the new instances create event? So true or false, do you want to do that? I said false. Don't worry about creating the event. The reason for doing that is because I'm going to copy this bullet. Now think about it. If I copy this bullet and I perform the create event, what will happen? It'll create another bullet. And then it'll create another bullet because you perform the create event and it'll just keep copying bullets, copying bullets. So we don't want to do that. So we just want to create one bullet. Then I'm using a with statement to hop inside the code for bullet two. Now, if you remember, bullet two is the variable that's now holding the ID of the newly created bullet, which was copied from the one that was created from the ship that shot it for the first time. So you can see all this code kind of works together if you want it to. I'm going to change it to have a vertical speed of minus 8 or negative 8, which means it's going to go up half the speed of the bullet that's going to the right. And you already saw that. When I loaded up my room, you already noticed that there was a bullet that went up. That's what's happening. The space bar is creating the bullet here. And when it's created, it's going to copy itself onto the same x and y value, the same spot in the room. And there we go. This one will perform horizontal speed, 16 to the right. And the copied one, this clone right here, will go at a speed of negative 8, minus 8, all the way to the top. So there you go. You can also copy or clone an object. Now that we know some ways of manipulating instances, which are separate from objects, which is great, so we can target just one in the room, one in particular, not all of the objects, just one, we can use ways to get certain values. We can check to see if an object exists. We can check the instance creation order and find which one was created at a certain number, like which one was the fifth one created. We can find out which object is furthest from our point or which one is nearest. And then we can see 
how many of a certain object is in a room. Now, for instance, exists, we already saw that. It was in the bullet. It was in its create event. It wants to know if instance exists object enemy. Now, if you remember, though, this exclamation mark means not. So we're looking for the opposite of this. We want to see if enemies don't exist. So if enemies don't exist, create that second bullet, which it did. But we're in a different room now. This is going to be our getter room. And inside, I've still got that same ship, but now I've put all these enemies in the game. And we're going to use these enemies as targets with furthest and nearest and, you know, everything else we've got here. If we hop inside our object player, and we go to where I was shooting. Remember, it was really complicated, and here's why. If I press the space key, I'm going to create a bullet. That's fine. And now we're going to check if an instance exists, and that instance is object enemy. So not just an instance, any instance of object enemy. You could search for just one instance, but in this case, I want all of the enemies. If there is an enemy somewhere in the room, that means it exists, we're going to do some things. And each one of these corresponds with what we were looking at. This one is instance nearest. You need a start point, the X and Y coordinate, and we're going to use just the X and Y coordinate of the object player, my spaceship. And then what object are you looking for? Which one should be nearest? And we want object enemy. So this will return the ID of the nearest enemy. We can also do the furthest. Same thing. Where do we start? And which one are we looking for? And we're going to store that ID in far enemy. Now, for instance find, this was the creation order. This returns the ID of the nth instance of a given object. So they're created in, in number orders, so like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever. So if we want to find, let's see, whatever the fourth one, the fourth enemy that was created, we would use 3, because 0 would be the first number, and store that ID in fourth enemy. Then we're going to go into a with statement of the new bullet, so we're going to be altering the code of the bullet we just created. And let's see what we can do. Let's use move towards point. If you remember this function, it just wants to know where to go. Well, we want the X and Y value of the nearest enemy. That's why we stored that ID so we can reference it. Once again, we're going to move at that speed of 16. So here's what that looks like. Okay, so we've got all our enemies spinning around. If I press the space key and create that bullet, it'll find the nearest enemy and move toward it. There we go. And if I keep going, it'll now calculate what the next one is. And the next one, and the next one. So it's kind of just heat seeking to the nearest enemy. And we can do the same thing with the furthest enemy. Let's just comment this one out, turn this one on, and it runs the exact same code. It just finds the farthest enemy, or furthest to be more specific. And when we end up in the room, now it'll target the furthest enemy. So let's try to manipulate that. Let's go really far away and see. This is probably the furthest, maybe. There we go. The only reason it shot that guy is he was in the way. Because that can happen. So there we go. It's shooting at the furthest enemy. Once again, it was in the way. Now this one targets the fourth enemy that was created. So let's see what this looks like. So which one is the fourth enemy that was created in the room? Turns out it was this guy. And then once he's dead, someone has to fill in that gap. So the fourth enemy would be the fifth enemy because everyone in that stack, that, that sequence of numbers, gets collapsed to fill in the gap. So five now becomes four. If I shoot him, he'll be dead and the guy who's sixth who just became fifth will now become fourth. So it keeps targeting the enemies in their instance order slowly backwards. But truthfully, the point is you can just find an instance that was created at some sort of number. Um, if you want to know more specifically about it, if I open up the room, I did create these guys by placing them and I probably placed them in a certain way that made this guy the fourth one or whatever. It just depends. Um, one, two, three, four. So it'd be this guy right here. There we go. That was the first one we shot because he's the fourth on the list. When he dies, there can be a blank space here. So all of these guys will then drop. So this would be the next guy I would target. And then I would target this guy and this guy. And that's pretty much what I did. So that's how the find function works. 
The last one here is instance number. This just returns the number of instances of an object that exist in the room, however many are left. And I've done that with my object player. Go to next room. If I'm in this room, if my room, this is current room, is equal to this name, then it will run this code, which is if instance number of object enemies less than one. None of them are there anymore. Less than one, zero, negative, doesn't matter. We can go to the next room. Now, what I want to do is change my shooting. Instead of targeting the fourth, let's just target the nearest guy. So here they are, they're all rotating around, and as I shoot, it'll target the nearest enemy each time. I can move around, it'll be this guy. I can manipulate that by making someone else nearest. And then when I shoot the last guy, I've gone to the next room, which was back when we were doing the two shots. So that's one way to use instance number is to do a check on if however many of them are no longer there, go to the next room and you know, you can do whatever you need to do with that or whatever. There could be when keys are gone, do something else, when doors are there, not there, when a certain, you can do the opposite way, when a certain number of enemies reaches a certain point, don't spawn anymore. So there are certain things you can do with these functions. The next two deal with collisions, and it's not actually about collisions, this is about returning the ID of the collided instance. And there are two ways to do it, instance place and instance position, and they're very similar, but the difference is instance place is going to use the bounding box of the calling object. So if my ship is the one saying, hey, if I were at this new spot, and uh, let's say object enemy is what we're going to do, then return the ID of the instance I'm colliding with. And now position is kind of the same thing, but it picks a single point. So it's not using the whole box, not using whatever I have up here, not this mask, there we go, which is precise on these pixels. It's actually going to just pick one pixel in the room, the one spot you want, and then say, okay, is there a guy there? Whatever object you want to put in this spot, this argument, and if something's there, yeah, get its ID. And then you get to store it into things, like we've been doing with the rest of these functions. And here are the ways I've used the two functions. Inside my object player, in draw, I've got this grow enemy. Now, if I'm using draw, um, I want to draw self to maintain the same sprite, but I also want to draw text. So I made it white. And now, if place meeting, that's just a collision function, we've used it before, at my x and y, object enemy. So if I'm colliding with an enemy, we're going to do this. We're going to use instance place, which is going to be wherever I am. That's the X and Y position. And then what I want to be colliding with. And I'm going to be colliding with an object enemy. So if I'm colliding with an object enemy, the enemy that is at my spot, at my place, store its ID in this variable called collided enemy. Now we can do something with it. And in this case, I'm just going to draw text above my character that is the string of collided enemy. So what it's going to do is collide with an enemy, get the ID of the enemy through instance place, store it in this variable, and then put it on screen. So that's pretty cool, I guess. We could also do this kind of thing with it. Um, with, I'm going to hop inside the enemy, the only one, now not all of them, not object, just instance, just the one I'm colliding with, and just say, hey, if my X scale isn't twice as big, start increasing it. So it looks cool. I, he's increasing in size as I'm colliding with him. So let's take a look at that. Here we go. Same room as before. Nothing special. But if I collide with an enemy, there we go. He grows. And that is his instance ID. Instance IDs in a room always start at 100,000 and then increment by one. So this guy was the seventh created, I believe. There we go. This guy was the second one because it starts at zero, which means me, the ship. I am 100,000. This guy was number one and it goes around. So let's collide with this guy. So he's, you know, 100,005. There's number four, nine, seven. And as you can see, I'm colliding with the instance of the enemy and it's not making all of them grow in size because we're targeting this specific ID. If I didn't do that, if I just said, like, object enemy, this would make sure that every instance would be changing scale. So, in this version, 
even though I'm colliding with an enemy and getting his ID, all of them grow. And that's the power of an instance ID. You want to be able to target just a specific instance and not every single object in the room that is under this name. A small thing just to show you is instance count. This is just a variable that is inside GameMaker. You can't really change it yourself, but it just tells you how many instances are in the room you are currently in. And I do have that displayed. You probably saw a number at the top left of my room, and I'm just drawing it here for my player. There it is, just drawing instance count. Just tells me how many instances are in the room. It's nothing special. It's up here. It says there are 11 instances in the room. And as I shoot, you'll see it go to 12 as it creates the bullet, but then it'll drop to 10 as the enemy and bullet die, and you can see it starts decreasing. So that's it. 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I can just keep decreasing a shooting. And there we go. Two of us. One, two. And that's just another one. That's, that's a blanket count of instances. So instead of instance number, where you can target a specific object. This one is just all of the instances in a room. Sometimes you need to do that um, to say if there are a certain number of instance, instances in my room, like a thousand, then don't make any more because that might slow down a mobile device or might slow down HTML5, something like that. So it's a good way of just keeping track of the number of instances. The last thing I'm going to show you is probably one of the most powerful, and this is instance deactivate and activate. Now, when you do this, you can do it to every instance in the entire room, all of them, a specific object, so all instances of a specific one, or a region. You can just pick a spot in your room, which could be um, the size of the view in the room, could be the entire room, although you'd probably want to pick all, or whatever. And this will deactivate the instances of this object. And what that means is kind of like pausing. When GameMaker gets to the code for an instance that is no longer active, it just skips over it. it. Everything is stored as it last was before you deactivated them, so whatever their image size was or their speed, things like that. And then you deactivate it, all that information is just held for a second, but is not updated. So it'll just keep skipping over this, skipping over this. Then when you activate them again, It'll just go right into this again and, and wherever it left off, whatever the speed was, whatever variables it had. So it's kind of a way of pausing the game and I'll show you the different ways you can do it. In this room, room zero, I've got some buttons, some enemies. Now the buttons are kind of interesting. It's drawing two different values. One is instance ID which is an array, and this is like instance number. It's which one was created first, and so on and so forth. So this is zero. This is the first one that was created. So I'm going to write down the ID of the first one that was created, and I'm going to write the ID of myself. This is my ID. It's going to reference object button play. Now I've got four of them in there. So if we just take a look at first, you'll notice the two different numbers, and I'll show you what they mean and how they correspond. All of these buttons right here, each one. The first number is the first instance created, which I said is always going to be 100,000. So that's pretty much as expected. Which was this one? This is the first instance created. So that's instance ID zero in that array. And I could have picked one and it would have been this guy. And then it's going to write its own ID above itself. So this is 100,000, 100,001, two, three, and there we go. Now what's important about this room is my object pauser. When it's created, I've got a pause state set to zero or false, and I'm just using that so I know if the game is paused, if it's not paused, whatever. And I'm going to be drawing, and it draws uh, a line going horizontal and vertical just so we know where the midpoint of the room is. And here's where our functions lie. When I release the P key, that's pretty typical for pause. If my pause state is true, so that means it equals one, it's true, that means the game is paused. Set it back to false, and then do one of these three things. The first thing I'll show you is instance activate and deactivate all, everything. Now of course if you're going to do that, what about this pause object? Are you going to pause that? Probably not. And that's where this comes in, deactivate all, true, false, not me. I've set that to true, not me. I don't want to pause myself because then I'd never be able to unpause the game. It would kind of just be frozen. 
So I want that to be true. So when I press the P key, if I'm paused, unpaused, if I'm not the opposite, that's all that little code block does. So here we go. I pressed P, all the objects are gone. Now, not only are all these objects stored right now, kind of in memory, just sitting in limbo, they don't draw anymore. Remember, they're not being updated. So it won't pause what they look like. They actually disappear. And if I unpause, there they are. So if you look at the rotation, right, they'll be stuck there. It was like facing this way and it just resumes. Something very simple. So it's not always the best way to pause your game because the objects disappear. But there are ways around that, you know, if you press pause, it goes to a menu so you don't see them. Or you can say if they're off the screen, which I'll show you with region. Here is region. Now you define it by saying, okay, where's the left and top pixel you want to start with? Okay, so whatever, zero, zero, that's the top of the room, top left right here. And then how wide and how tall is this region going to be and I said just half the width and height so that's just a quarter of the room the top left corner then it needs to know a few things when you deactivate it wants to know do you want to use the inside of this region or the outside okay so here's where it's going to come into play let's pretend this is my game screen now enemies start leaving the screen you're scrolling it's a runner you could destroy them but if you want to come back to them you don't want them to be destroyed you just want them to be paused in limbo you want to deactivate them you would say false, outside, not inside, outside. And it'll pause anything that is not in your view. You probably set this up to view and we will go over that in a future video. But in this case, I'm gonna pause anything that's inside this view. And then once again, do you wanna pause the pauser? No, in this case, <laughs> once again, not me. So I can unpause the game. And then for activate, you can do the same thing. I've chosen the exact same region, same rules, so I can reactivate that same spot. Here's my game again, they're just rotating, and if I press the pause button, anything that was in this top left corner, which yes, this button is just like a pixel over into the region, and it's being deactivated. But check that out, I made them go off sync from each other by doing it, so yes, you can see that they're not continually updating. They do pause any animation that's happening, any variables, anything, it's all paused. Now I could set that to false just to show you what that would be like if it used the outside. So now this time if I press the P key, everything that's outside of that region will be paused and unpaused. And that's what you'd wanna do with your view of your game as you're moving around. Things that go outside of your view would be paused and then when you come back into view, they would come back. So when they're paused, they're not really taking up any memory or any anything like that because they're not being updated. And the last one is just pretty simple. You just pick an object. So if for some reason I wanted to pause all of the enemies, I could do that. Um, you're, it's going to be the exact same thing. It's nothing special. You can target specific things. Hey, you could even use an instance ID from something you just created. So there's enemy, not very special. But yeah, you could put in the ID of an instance here and pause one instance. If for some reason that's important to your game, you could do it. So there we go. These are the different ways you can manipulate instances in your game so that you don't have to always manipulate an object because instances take all their information from that object and you're going to affect all of them as we saw when I collided with the enemy and they all grew to twice the size. So I now hope that you know different ways to affect instances separate from objects. <laughs> <laughs>